All right. In today's episode, we're wrapping up a series dedicated to my co-host, Olivia. And instead of writing a letter to her, as I have for Noelle and Lizzie this past season, I wanted to do something a bit different. I wanted to revisit what I think is the most important question that Olivia asked and one that we actually went back to again and again in the episodes dedicated to her. The question that she asked as a Christian but as someone who sometimes wrestles with this question, is why is why is Jesus worth it? We'd like to dig a little deeper into that with my co-host and today's special guest as well. Welcome back to the Finding Something Real podcast, friend. This is your host, Janelle Wood, and you are listening in for Season 7, where we talk with young women from various backgrounds about their faith journeys and allow them the space to ask tough questions about life, God, and Christianity. Today, we're recording an episode for my sweet friend, Olivia. I highly recommend listening to last week's episode with Jason Schmidt, which we'll link in the show notes. And here's a short clip from a conversation we had with Olivia. I definitely agree on, um, how can I say it? Like if it was just based on like church experiences or just interacting with humans in general, I definitely believe too, I would have left, you know, Jesus and all in all, because I mean, humans aren't perfect, but there's definitely been times where, you know, people in church, people outside always think people in church are, you know, perfect, but really they are, and they can just stab you just as bad. And Mm -hmm. I've definitely had um, heartbreak and stab in the back and, uh, you know, very not godly things happen to me in churches. And I definitely think too, that's kind of where people kind of think, well, they're supposed to be godly people and I don't want to interact with people like that. So of course they leave because they don't feel comfortable in something like that. But I definitely think that's kind of the line between religion and a relationship with Jesus. Um, Mm -hmm. And having a relationship with Jesus is nothing compared to what those people from church would do to you. So I definitely agree on, you know, that if you're just counting it on um, people, I definitely would have left as well. (laughs) Olivia couldn't be here today, but I invited a special friend to co-host this episode with me. She's actually visiting me from Chicago and she's upstairs in my house, but I told her this space was too small for her to share with me. And she's one of the reasons this podcast even exists, to be honest. Uh, Six years ago, she invited me to co-host a monthly podcast with her as part of a ministry for young women. And after a few months of doing that together, she realized it wasn't for her. And I felt compelled to keep going, but I didn't want to go alone. And after months of wrestling and agonizing about this and going back and forth, trying to figure out ways to do something together, this friend flat out told me, and I'll say quote, but it wasn't exactly this. She said, Janelle, I think God's leading you and you're saying no to him because you're afraid. Ouch. Something like that. Uh, But she was right. And word to the wise, get yourself friends who speak truth to you in love um, and aren't afraid of the consequences. Welcome back to the Finding Something Real podcast, my friend, Melanie. Melanie, welcome. Hi. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Do you remember talking to me like that? Mm -hmm. I I do. (laughs) Friends who call you higher. Friends who call you higher. (laughs) Amen. Amen. (laughs) You certainly have done it for me. So. Yeah, good. Well, I I consider you one of my closest friends, Melanie, and I'm really glad you're here. Although, thank you for not making me breathe on you in this space. um, I mean, it it could have... (laughs) I've done it the last couple of times I've recorded with a couple of people. It's fine. But um, thank you for being upstairs. I appreciate the the arm room here. Um, I'm excited about today's special guest because uh, I had watched a reel for a little background. I was on Katie Bulmer's podcast and she was over here on mine. Uh, I think it was last year, the year before, I can't remember. Um, And uh, so I've always, I'm interested in Katie's work. And she shared a reel of her talking to Dr. Lisa Stanton. And I remember watching it thinking, wow, this woman's story is so interesting of how she came to the Lord and also the things that she's been through. Um, It's just Sometimes, you know, I think we learn really well through story and it's something, those kind of things stick with us. And so we reached out to her, Anna did, and uh, lo and behold, she said, sure. And so now she's here today. But before like we officially say anything, you and I actually listened to some of that episode today at the coffee shop. 
And I think it was so cool because you're from Chicago and you were, you kept on pausing it. I mean, I, I think you paused it like 10 times <laughs> to tell me we've got this in common and we've got this in common. It was pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm just making that up. No. Is no, 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 uh, no, you did. I, I, I paused and stopped it multiple times. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in the beginning, I did tell you like, hey, what did she just say? What was that? Because I was doing some <laughs> other work too. But um, what were some of the things that stood out to you about her story? Yeah, I, I think, oh, well, I don't want to go into too many details already. But mm, no. I think the I think obviously the Chicago connection, and then um, just the um, kind of living to like having almost like a double life uh, mm. kind of stuck out to me and things of that nature. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to introduce her today. Uh, Dr. Lisa Stanton, she has an incredible story of finding something real with the Lord. She has a book coming out in early December called 52 Life-Changing Lessons I Learned in Recovery, A Journey Towards Sobriety, Honesty, and Radical Forgiveness. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Lisa Stanton. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it too. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you for being on here. Like we mentioned, I listened to some of your story on the Truth For Your 20s podcast. um, And I really just wanted to invite you on here to share your faith journey. Uh, We'll start with that and then we can dive into some of what Olivia shared and and asked about. But yeah, yeah, tell us about you. (laughs) <laughs> like it's such a big story. I know. <laughs> um, I know we had talked about some different like pieces of it. I'll start with when I was young. Um, I went to church a little bit with my dad. My mom, I think, identified as Unitarian. Um, but we went to Unitarian. I don't even know what they call it. It's not church, but like show such meeting whatever fellowship uh, <laughs> like i don't know but only like a few times in my whole childhood so like not very relevant so mom is basically agnostic dad was christian um and we went to church with my dad um it's funny it's come back to me more over time quite a bit we switched denominations a lot though and my mom doesn't believe in god um and there was a bunch of stuff that i don't think i would have identified as childhood trauma that happened when I was younger, that kind of like, but now I understand it to be more that, that kind of pushed me into being like, if this is happening, how is God real? And that's anything from like one of my good friends got murdered when I was in fifth grade by his mother who then committed suicide. So like the separation of like, how could God create a mother who would do that is like kind of what my thinking was. And then like my stepdad's ex-wife, who's also a mother died at that time. And, um, a girl who we were kind of adopting at my dad's house. My parents were divorced by then. Um, Like also there was just a lot of death and confusion and my parents were divorced, which of course is very confusing. Um, And I think I kept going to church a little bit through middle school, high school, but it really trickled away. And I was just sort of like, I, I got really into education, which of course is why I have this vast educational background now. But I kind of came up into this educational era where it's like smart people don't believe in God, like opiate of the masses, Karl Marx, like this whole thing that like people use religion to escape reality and they're not living in reality anymore and whatever. Um, And that may actually be true of some of the structures of religion, but that's not the same as a relationship with God, which I now know. Um, I basically departed from that in middle school, high school, and I would have never connected it to how the next 15 years of my life went until I came back to it. But around that time, basically like my entire mental health goes down the tubes. Um, I started suffering from eating disorders pretty dramatically. Um, so like sophomore year of high school, um, I went from 115 to 88 pounds in like three months. Um, I was like five, four and five, six now. Um, but just to give people, because it, it makes a difference how <laughs> tall you are with the meaning of that. I mean, either way, it's 20, 30 pounds, um, but super intense eating disorder. And then that never really got resolved. And then I started drinking and then I started stealing medications from my mom. And then I got into drugs and then I'm doing like pills or drinking or eating disorder for basically like the entirety of my late teens and 20s. Um, and then kind of like Melanie alluded to at the same time, like I got almost all A's in high school. I went to University of Richmond to run division one track and cross country. Like 
did my leg break because of the eating disorder and drug use? And then I never actually ran like, yes. Um, but I was doing well enough in all these different areas. I got, I think my GPA in college is like a three, not, and I can't even remember, but I go on to, um, a PhD in psychology at a place that I can't remember at the time it was ranked like seventh ish, whatever top 10 in the country. Um, for a PhD in psychology, I go on to a postdoctoral fellowship at Northwestern school of medicine in Chicago, which is how we ended up in our Chicago connection. So like the outside I'm, I'm doing well, but on the inside, like I'm going home and I'm like vomiting up my food on purpose and I'm drinking until I'm blacked out. And like, I'm not actually well at all. Um, and sort of the short version of the story is that brought me to what I now would call my rock bottom, um, where I basically like was drinking 24 hours a day. And then the people around me, I mean, the people around me had always been concerned, um, but the people around me got even more concerned than they had been. Um, and that journey landed me in alcoholism recovery. And then I ended up in a version of alcoholism recovery. Where people are like, you need a higher power. And I'm like, I don't need a higher power. Like I did that. I understand that I'm not doing that. And then I think also if I watch how that like family of origin faith had developed over that time, my mom had gone from Unitarian to really just like nothing. Um, and both families are actually ethnically Jewish. Um, both of my mom's parents and then my dad's dad, but he like had a bar mitzvah and everything. And he had kind of circled back into like, he even goes to tourist study, like super involved in, being Jewish, but my stepmom is still Christian. Like the whole thing was just like the adults in this world don't even know what's going on. <laughs> like, why would I think that any of these things are real? Um, and they tell me I need a higher power. And I'm like, I don't even know. Um, and I ended up selecting the universe for the time being. Um, and that was because I, we had, I think we talked about this a little bit, but I had during my twenties and during all of this, like I was always seeking, like I knew that I was sick. I just wasn't really sure what the problem was. And I had gone pretty deep into like, uh, like new age stuff and meditation. And I became a yoga teacher and was really into astrology and tarot cards and meditating on my water to make it do things. I can't even remember. I took a psychic mediumship class, like all over the board um, in that realm, I had crystals everywhere. I just spent time like wandering around crystal stores, picking up, I think like Abraham Hicks, it's just like straight, he communicates with, I don't even know a whole weird area of life, but that led me to when I got there being like, okay, well I can choose a higher power. That's just like the universe. So I like tried to proceed in recovery with the universe as my higher power. And this is actually like, I used to think of it as the annoying part of my story, but I think it's actually one of the coolest parts of my story because things got worse and they like should get worse. Like I should be, I chose a higher power. I'm trying to do these steps and like things should be getting better. And what is so interesting about addiction, which I, I don't want to say like, I love it, but it, it shows your cards really quickly. So I was able to not drink alcohol anymore but my eating disorder got terrible and I fell deeper into anxiety. And it's like, it put me face to face with anyone who's recovered from alcoholism basically knows that alcohol was a symptom, wasn't the problem. The underlying problem is like, I don't feel at peace in the world. I have a God sized hole is what they end up calling it. Right. Um, but like, I feel alone in an empty room. I have an anxiety complex, all of these things. And I drink to soothe it. And so I was able to not drink. And then all of those things got worse. And I was like, this is supposed to be getting better. This is not supposed to be getting worse to the point that um, by December of 2020, I was having daily panic attacks. I was binging and purging, just like full bulimic behavior, like five, six times a day. Like it's taking up my entire day. I'm supposed to sort of be doing my job at Northwestern School of Medicine, but it had become remote. And we did a lot of work with cancer patients and it was COVID. So there wasn't like too much to do during that time anyway, because of immunity issues. So I didn't have that much work to do, but I was, I had devolved to just like, why am I even sober if I'm spending the entire day anxious and stuck in an eating disorder? Um, and that's when I, for some reason, went to this um, recovery meeting that I had been avoiding that everyone was like, I think you would really benefit from going. It was at 630 in the morning and it was in a weird part of town. And I was like, I don't want to go there. Um, and finally on Christmas morning of 2020, I went there. Um, and that's really when my story takes a turn. And that's when I found a group of people that I felt like had 
found joy, right? It wasn't even that they weren't drinking alcohol. It was like they found joy. And I really had never experienced like internal peace, internal joy, any of that. Um, and I asked them what they did. And the short version of the story is they were like, God, like <laughs> the one that's all three parts of it. Like, you can't, <laughs> and like to me, Jesus, like I could almost use the word God by then, but like Jesus still was like, that's for dumb people. I'm not doing that. Mm. Right. And they were like, well, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I remember so specifically now his name is Kevin, the man who's now my husband. I met in that meeting and he was like, so joyful and just like full of energy. Mm. And I'm like, what do you do? And he goes, hop in the truck and I'll show you. And we drove to a church and he like we walked <laughs> into this church. There's like a cross. So it was a Catholic church. So what's like extra funny about that is I, I don't, I'd never really seen like a crucifix before. Like a cross is one thing, but like Jesus hanging on the cross in front of me mm-hmm. is another thing. And he was purposely bringing me to that type of church so that I would have to come face to face, like with Jesus, mm-hmm. not just with a symbol of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was like, basically like go to the front, get on your knees and turn your will over to God if you're willing to do it. Um, Like with Jesus hanging on the cross above my head. um, And I don't even know why I just was like, fine, like I I surrender. And I feel like that's the first day where I finally was like, I'm willing to try this. I really don't know. And like something came over me that I can't even explain where I'm like, I'm willing to surrender all the way to like Jesus. And I'm not even sure that I fully understood what that meant that day. I don't even know today if I fully understand what that means. I don't think I'm supposed to fully comprehend all of God. Um, But like that day, it wasn't just the universe. It wasn't just God. It was like, it was, it was, it was God, obviously, because Jesus is a part of God, but it was like, you're going to swallow the whole, the whole of this. You're going to swallow the new Testament without reading it. Right. Like this is, this is now the gospel that you're surrendering to. This is um, salvation that you're surrendering to, not just like, it's God and like I have crystals and I meditate. Um, and that day is actually my sobriety date, which I never would have known at the time. Um, but I never drank or used again after that day. And also that's the day where like my life really started to change. And it wasn't just that like singular experience of that day. But when I look back, there was so many pieces of the puzzle where God was like moving people. Like I had even gone to a church once or twice in Chicago, which I didn't remember until recently. Um, and so like these little seeds were being planted along the way and it all just kind of like culminated into that. And then like within a few weeks of that, I'm like going home and one day just like, I need to open a Bible. Do I even have a Bible? Where's a Bible? And like read the entire book of Romans in a day, right? Like when you start moving, God's just like, okay, girl, like (laughs) it's time, let's get into it. Um, and like started to really experience change in my life. Um, and I know we talked about maybe talking about forgiveness some, but that's when I really understood that like prayer and prayer to ask God for help, like forgiving other people, getting forgiveness for my own anger. Like I watched people that I thought I would never forgive. And I just like, I wasn't even bothered by them anymore. And that happens, like, obviously it's not magic. It's not overnight. It's a bajillion prayers and a lot of tears and a bunch of other things. Um, But like, it, my life just changed quickly. And that was the foundation of me being like, okay, I guess like Jesus is the answer here. And it didn't, what's interesting is like, it didn't come necessarily through theology. It came like through experience. And then I was like, okay, now I need to understand what even just was happening and started like attending church regularly and getting into Bible studies and like all of these other things. But it came kind of in like the reverse order of, oh, I don't know if there's a normal in coming to faith, but. (laughs) I I love that. I love that because I was just watching something. I can't remember. I'm sure it was something I saw on social media, but it was about the thief on the cross Mm -hmm. and how, you know, he had no theology other than he saw Jesus. He put his faith in him. He said, remember me. And it was like, that's enough, you know, like that, mm-hmm. that's enough just to come to him is enough. And then he's the one that does the work. Right. Yeah. So I love your story because it's like, you tried all these other things. They weren't working for you. You had that God shaped hole. And then, you know, to just 
be like, I don't get it, but I, I'm done with myself. I mean, what a beautiful, and I've heard lots of coming to Jesus stories, you know, but it is, that is super powerful. Had you found any relief with the new age stuff that you had tried? Did any of it feel good for a moment or were you finding some relief in that for, for a period of time or? Yeah. Just so curious. That's so interesting. And like everyone's experience is different and I value that, but like, you'll hear some people be like, I never found anything there, whatever. And I'm like, why'd you keep doing it then? Right. I think what's actually so wild about like, sometimes I hate to give the devil too much credit, but like how evil or how, you know, like pulling you out of the truth works is like, I think it's supposed to feel comforting for a little while. And that's like why it's so confusing in the same way that like alcohol is a great example of like, I know it's not a new age practice, but it's like, I kept doing it because it did provide relief. Did it also provide like a ton of damaged relationships, a ton of consequences, a ton of almost legal consequences? Like, absolutely. But it provided relief. And like, I can remember like walking out of yoga class and for 10 minutes being like, I have found the answer to all of my like spiritual (laughs) right? And it's like not, and I wasn't doing like everyday YMCA yoga. I was doing like, 31 minute kundalini meditations on Halloween. So just to be clear, I don't, I'm not trying to have like a huge diatribe against yoga. I was like way out in the weeds of super spiritualized, like strange practices of yoga. Um, and I don't know if you guys have an opinion on YMCA, whatever, but I was just, I don't want to scare anyone out of stretching. I was like way in left field. Um, and so like those things to me or like meditating with crystals, or I remember like trying to take that psychic medium class or even going to a tarot card reader. Like there is a weird, I feel like presence that comes over you where you're like, this is going to give me the answer. And then you like feel better for a little, like if I didn't walk out of a tarot card reader being like, okay, I can see that the 12 swords is going to mean this. And my husband is coming then and whatever, if that didn't like provide me some relief, I wouldn't have kept doing it. And I think that's what's so like scary about it and why truth is so important is because like it provides this sort of like unfinished feeling of like semi-relief. Like the only way I can describe it is it feels super similar to me to like the relief that comes from drugs and alcohol is that it's like it feels relieving, but you like know it's ending and it's kind of just like an unsettling relief. Um but I think a lot of those practices really did provide that form of unsettling relief for me. And so I like thought I was finding solution. But in the end, if like my if you looked at like my overall trajectory, it's like I'm finding these little blips of relief, but I'm just like falling deeper into like, okay, why am I upping my doses of every psych medication I'm on? Why am I having worse panic attacks than before? Why right? Like things are getting worse and I'm just finding these like little moments of relief along the way. Yeah. Well, I I want to allow Mel to jump in here in just a second, but what what you're sharing reminds me of two episodes that we've had on this podcast. One was with Drew Barriessa, who shared about um, coming out of a same-sex relationship when he was in high school. And he said, you know, something that I wish more people would admit is that sin feels good for a while. It feels good for a while. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. Um, you wouldn't be involved in these different things. And he always quotes a verse, I think it's in Proverbs, where for the person who's satisfied, uh, gosh, I, I'm going to totally misquote this, um, but something like, uh, we'll share it in the show notes. For the person who's satisfied, honey is not as sweet, but for the person who's hungry, it's like everything, right? And um, so we'll share that. I'll look it up later and, and not misquote it. And then the other episode that I was thinking of was one that we did with um, the theologian, um, Doug Grotheis, who's done a lot of work with the new age stuff. And one of the things that he shared, um, as an apologist and a theologian, he just said, uh, the reason why the spiritual realm is something we shouldn't mess with is because it's real. There is a real power. (laughs) And, uh, so anyway, I, I just was thinking about both of those things as you were sharing, because it certainly sounds like you encountered both of those things. Um, and, Mel, what what what's going through your head as uh, Lisa was sharing her story? Yeah, I just I really appreciate the fact that you're honest about like 
doing those practices and you actually having a sense of relief and how like aligning yourself to true truth is what ultimately brought that that clarity that that true relief that true satisfaction because although i agree we don't need to give the devil too much credit not acknowledging that he has been given temporary dominion is also not right either because we do you know we we do we live in a very intellectual world and even here in america um so much of like conversations around spiritual warfare or the demonic or things like that are just kind of like oh that's like weird woo stuff like we just don't even acknowledge it right but that's also not to acknowledge it is also to deny the scriptures and to deny what um we see in in the word um and so i yeah i just i really resonate with that because i see that a lot um and the the spiritual realm is very real and the enemy can use and does use these different type of practices um, and he he knows how to turn the degree of truth off just one degree to confuse us just enough to think that we have what you know everything that we need or um, have all of the solutions that we need um, but ultimately it's aligning ourselves back to the true compass and true north of christ that brings us those um satisfying and ultimately the the freedom that we're looking for it's mm. good it's good before we hit record uh lisa i asked you if you were familiar with mary carr's work uh, her memoir lit um which is not a christian book by any means but a very what I think very well written a memoir of somebody who came out of um, addiction, and uh, and it was recommended to me by a pastor, so I'm just going to put it out there. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, she once said, and I was looking up quotes by Mary Carr. I thought this was really good, but she said, "When I got sober, I thought giving up was saying goodbye to all the fun and all the sparkle, and it turned out to be just the opposite. That's when the sparkle started for me." Um, I'm just curious if you found the same thing or if you had the same feelings when you decided, oh, okay, fine. I'm going to look at this crucifix and I'm done. Like had the sparkle already faded or was it still something that you kept finding? Yeah. So, I mean, my last relapse, so I had done Coke like the day before the crucifix incident. So it's not like <laughs> I was very far away from drugs at that time, just to yeah. be clear. Um, what's super interesting, um, I don't, well, I'll just ask the follow-up question if you know it. Does Mary Carr have a relationship with God at all? Like even if mm -hmm. she doesn't identify yes. as, okay. Yeah, um, and I was, I think she's Catholic at this point in her life, but I, okay. I could be wrong about that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, because I also, mm -hmm. if you read my book, I am not pitching myself as a Christian author and that's actually to capture the audience of people who is me mm -hmm. four years ago. Yeah. Um, and I often mm -hmm. wonder with, like Mary, if she's actually doing the same thing, mm -hmm. that makes sense. like I introduced yeah. like that, I'm going to say the word God in the introduction that I'm going to use male pronouns and here's why I do, but mm -hmm. I don't, it's like a tiptoe. Yeah. Um, so intentionally. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So I always find that interesting when, um, I like think that lots of authors who are trying to like move people in that direction are like secretly actually much more Christian than it comes off in their book. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would suspect perhaps yes. Um, and I haven't read enough of her memoir to know for sure. Um, but from what I can tell, yes. And she also does like almost, it's interesting because she doesn't moralize uh, almost anything that she does or, it, you know, there's no like, she just lets it fall where it may. But um, when she comes to the part where she comes to God, she admits like this might be weird for people and she speaks directly. And what I found interesting, the parallels between your story and hers is intellectualism, you know, that like pursuit of knowledge and that pursuit of like, I mean, the New York society and things that she was rubbing shoulders yeah. with as she was living this other life. Yeah. And because um, we didn't even talk about like you have a PhD in psychology. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So you're, I mean, you're, yeah. you're doing all that stuff. <laughs> doing all that. I can yeah. actually answer. It just helps me answer the question, yes. to know a little bit more about like where her quote yeah. came from. Um, Cause who knows, but I think we both agree about the answer now. So what's 
interesting to me is that like when I first, so if we just make like January 4th, 2021, like the date of like before and after essentially, um, I don't think right away on January 4th, I felt that way. And that is because I had just turned my life over to God. God had not yet changed my heart in the way that he was about to. Mm -hmm. Um, And I still saw sparkle in the fancy men that I was dating. I still saw sparkle in my PhD in like, I make fun of my level of education now. I didn't make fun of my level of education at the time. It was very serious and I had worked very hard for it. No, it's like a whole, like my like heart hadn't changed in terms of understanding like where real joy lies in life. Like I truly thought that I was going to be like really sad to not be in bottle service all the time anymore. Like devastated to not be at tables that cost $10,000 that men had formerly invited me to. Right. Like I, like that was what I thought sparkle was, was a lot of that, like thing or like who my friends are and my friends are important. And I know the CEO of this and the guy that I dated was the CEO of that. And he started that tech company like that. I thought like was the sparkle of life, if that makes sense, because I just couldn't, my heart hadn't changed. I hadn't experienced like the subtleness of joy that I think when God changes a heart happens. And so I completely agree with it now because it's like the super simple things. Like I can remember before January 4th, 2021, if someone was like, wow, that's such a beautiful sunset. I was like, what the heck are you like? <gasps> what? You find that? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Or in like spending time with your family. Like I truly, my emotions were so shut down and like my experience of love was so shut down that I wasn't even like experiencing that. I think the way that other people experience that like I didn't have the joy of a cup of coffee with my friend. I literally be like, that is so boring. Could we have 10 drinks? Right. Like I didn't get it. So what's interesting is that like the simplicity of the sparkle now is so different than what it was before, if that makes sense. Like one of the most fun things in my life is sitting down with like I just started working with a new sponsee in recovery the other day who's absolutely nuts. Just like I was right. There's nothing particularly (laughs) special about that, but I was, we're all nuts when we arrive, but it's like, I know what that's going to look like in several years Mm -hmm. um, or in a few months even. Um, And I think that's the cool part. So I feel like this whole new sparkle has come, but it didn't come for me by just like presence of alcohol, absence of alcohol, because just the absence of alcohol without the change of heart that comes from God just feels like now I'm not allowed in bottle service anymore. And now I'm not allowed to be like the cute girl in a dive bar or whatever like thing I thought I was getting out of these things. But then when, when God comes into your heart, there's like so much joy and just like human connection and nature and like daily life and understanding, like even just being there for a friend feels really different where I was like, my friends like having drama, right? Is how I felt before. But then like with the change of heart, there's this like human connection actually feels like something. And I feel like it didn't before, which is why I was just like searching for random dopamine hits in mm. various sin categories is how I would describe it today. Yeah. <laughs> was it was it painful too? You mentioned, you know, your, your lifestyle started to change, like mm-hmm. your friends, mm-hmm. did those things change? And I, I know, you know, I'm thinking of some of the young women who might hear your story later, uh, some of them very close to giving their lives to the Lord, but have told me in, in different contexts, you know, my life would have to change. And it's a scary thing because like what we're just talking about, there's some glitter and some sparkle to some of those other things. And I, w- I would say none of them, you know, I, I don't know, but I don't think any of them are, are alcoholics or addicts, you know, but they are enjoying the lifestyle that they have. And something I tell them often is, you know, Jesus is the one who does the work after you come to him. It's not like... I've got all these prerequisites before you can even come, um, but it's a scary prospect for them. So would you mind speaking to that a little bit, Lisa? And you may not alleviate their fears and that's okay. <laughs> no, I alleviate them, I guess, in a less extreme. Like I, I do think like, sure, I took it to the extreme, but that the same is true even at less extreme levels. And what I've seen also in my life 
over the last four years. I'll just say like since I've given my life to Christ, since we're coming up on January 4th, 2025. So just about four years ago, is that like God will introduce you to like God will do two things. One is I don't think the separation, the friends that leave, you just won't be as sad as you think you're going to be about it, I guess is what I would say, is I thought that it was going to be like, it was a little bit painful in the beginning, but then I started to realize that like the people that God was bringing into my life who are believers, who are new, who are going to challenge me on my faith, who are going to grow with me in this area. Um, And I think it provided a lot of growth for me to begin to understand that like, there are lifelong friends who will be there no matter what, whether whether they've come with me on the journey or not. Like my high school friends, I'm 33 years old. So the fact that I'm talking at all about my high school friends is interesting. But so like they're friends. I went to a small high school. So they're most of them are people I met in kindergarten. So like I I'm they didn't go anywhere, right? Like the people who have known you for your lifetime, just like I would say people who have good hearts who have known you for your lifetime, they are like, we are so excited for you that you're sober. We're so excited for you that you're so jazzed about God, even if we're not. We're so excited for, you know what I mean? That like, and they just get to like be there for the journey. They're excited about my book. They they just like want me to be happy. Um, and I think that's been really cool to see. Um, and then I feel like the friends that I had like right at the end of sort of like the, when I was the most lost in, like, I just want to like be in the world lifestyle, I guess I would say that like, I lost those friends, but when I really sat down with it, and I guess when I say lost, like no one's really mad at me. You know what I mean? It was just like, I'm not going to spend my Saturday drinking on a boat anymore. So we don't have anything in common anymore. But I don't think there's any, I mean, maybe they have ill will toward me, but I don't think there's any like ill will. I've never experienced that. And when I've seen them at like normal events around the city, no one seems mad. We're like, oh, hey, good to see you. And yeah, I can just like move on. But I feel like the idea of what my, what I think my life is going to look like is a lot more painful than the actual process of that. And then also to realize that like, it's letting go of the past, but it's also opening up to like a whole new thing. And that keeps happening. Like the girl I would call my best friend today, I met also on Christmas day, 2020. So like the day, within days of this whole situation happening, I now have a girl that I talk to almost every day for the last four years, right? Like my, I have a group of girlfriends that all kind of came out of that, like recovery space. We're all growing in God together. As I like really found more identity, like in Christ, there's like more like explicitly Christian women, right? Cause recovery can be sort of like, I mean, all of my friends in recovery are Christian, but <laughs> it's a little bit more like <laughs> ambiguous. Um, <laughs> yeah. They're not like lifelong Christians, I guess. And then like becoming more friends recently with people. Um, I guess who I would say are more grounded in like church instead of grounded in AA, but are Christian. Um, but it's just like all of these new people. And then it's so cool to see the connections that you can make and how you can grow with them. And they're inviting you to their Bible study and their group of friends and they're this. And like people, people who have God in their heart are so welcoming that it's not like, it's not like the scary making new friends with like people in bars or like at where you get your nails done or something. Right. Like it's people who are like, wanting to see you succeed and wanting to see you grow in Christ. And those are just like such cool friendships that instead of, I know it's like hard probably if you're listening, but like, instead of focusing on the ones you're going to lose, it's like, think of the new groups of friends that you're going to make. It's good. It's good. Any feedback on that, Mel? I just like, I keep on thinking about just these, like, like, to not be afraid of the Lord closing doors so that new doors can open. That's like something that has like really I've thought about a lot over the last year, even of like having these fears of like doors closing. Um, I had like dreams about it even in the beginning of the year. And like just thinking like the Lord has just been so kind and like just because a door closes, don't be afraid of that because like when a door opens, like 
the other side of that, what comes after that is like beyond anything you could imagine. Like, because life with me is beyond anything that you can imagine. Um, and so like in the world, we're afraid of closed doors. And that's what the world tells us is like closed doors means like the end of something or loss or, you know, uh, maybe grieving something, but also with the Lord, like he redeems things, he restores things and he like, he he brings a new meaning to the old. Um, mm. So that's what came to my mind when you were talking. So it's good. It's good. So you come to Christ. Uh, you don't really know what you're doing, but you you come to the end of yourself. You surrender. Uh, then what? What what has been the most instrumental things in your walk with Christ since then? Because obviously, Lisa, you're sitting here today. You just written this book. You're on fire for the Lord. Uh, you and your husband are serving him. It wasn't just that one time decision. I know that scripture talks about that, right? Like there's people who receive it and quickly get excited. And then the worries of the world, sh- you know, shut it all down. What kept you from shutting down? Do you think I- I'd love for you to share that um, and your spiritual growth over the last few years? Yeah. A couple of things come to mind right away. One of them um is I have the gift, which I know not every listener may have, but in a way you do have it. Uh, You have it spiritually, the gift of being at the point of life or death, right? So like it was a life or death errand that I start my day with prayer on my knees, that I end my day with prayer on my knees, that when I get disturbed during the day, I start praying right away, right? So I had the gift of understanding that like just a few days before I was doing drugs that I could have overdosed and died and I was throwing up all day. So it's like, now I'm not, I don't want to let go of this. So, but it's the same thing, even if your circumstances aren't as extreme, you know what I mean? I, like I said, it was life or death, but then I'm like, it's life or death in terms of like, even if you're just experiencing like a little bit of anxiety or a little bit of despair, right? It's like, why not not experience anxiety and despair? Um, and so for me, it took like developing this relationship. And I think in the beginning, I probably prayed 50 times a day, um, like would pause and like get on my knees, pray 50 times a day. I mean, I kind of pray all the time in my head about everything now. Um, but I think it developed that habit of, I know it's, it's hard. And if you're new, you pray all the time, but I can't remember the verse, but it's like that, Mm -hmm. like pray without ceasing. Um, and I started praying all the time, but one thing that was taught to me early on, um, that it, it's kind of, I feel like a little bit of a recovery thing, but I think it translates into just a close relationship with God is there's a super central piece um, of confession to God for me that I was told early on that like, if you can't clear the channel, you don't have a channel and to just like pray for guidance and pray for God's will and like knowledge of God's will and the power to carry that out and all of these things. Um, without confessing the sins that I'm doing every day to God. Um, And so for me, since I would say most days, probably five out of seven days a week, um, I end my day by at least in my head and often on paper, just like quickly going through any sins that I committed during the day and just like praying to God, praying for any insight about how to not keep committing them, how to whatever. Um, And so for me, I feel like the bookending my day with prayer, I often lay in my bed and my husband's on his knees beside the bed reading prayers at night. But in the morning, I actually get on my knees. Um, (laughs) Maybe someday I'll graduate to on my knees at night also. But there's something about that surrender for me of like Mm -hmm. being on my knees that I find helpful. Um, But so in terms of just like my daily practices, um, those two things, and then I try to somewhere in my day get into the word. So like whether it's even just flipping my Bible open for just like a minute and reading a random verse in the morning, whether it's actually trying to like study a chapter, whether it's, it looks different every day, whether it's sometimes it's listening. I really like um, listening to, um, there's like an app that reads you a couple Bible verses and I do it with my eyes closed on the treadmill, which I know sounds crazy, but <laughs> um, it's like I hold on and I'm only walking at like two miles an hour and it helps me to just like 
really get into the verse and not be thinking like, oh, my back hurts in this one. Like, <laughs> sit there and think about it. Um, so I would say like morning prayer, evening prayer, confession of sin every day. Um, and then like the word of God. I, for a while, was just like praying all the time. And it's like, I have to know who God is, what he says. And the best way to do that is like, he gave me a giant book to has all that in there. So why am I not looking at that book? Because I would go through periods, especially early on, where it was like, oh, the Bible's too confusing or whatever it is. Um, but really getting into the word. Um, and then eventually for me, like joining Bible studies, which I think are equal part study of the word and like having other people who are trying to grow in faith around me. Um, so just like having community is a huge thing because I think if I just stayed on an island, I would start to second guess myself. Even with a huge community around me, I start to second guess myself sometimes. Um, so I think just like having that community around me, right? Like telling people around me, like, hey, I think I believe in God now. I'm going to try to go on this. I can remember actually one of the first recovery meetings I went to, a young people's meeting, which is a very scary place to say that you love Jesus. Um, and cause all the cool kids like are angsty and the <laughs> universe. Um, and I like went to this meeting and I don't even know, I think it was on step three and everyone was like, Oh, my higher power in the universe and whatever. And it came to me. And I remember sitting there and I was almost shaking and I was like, I think I love Jesus now. And then the girl beside me, like, yes. on the screen, and she's like, it's okay. You're allowed to love him. I do too. <laughs> Um, which I feel like speaking it out because when it's just, it's, and it can feel like if you're, if the people here are new, it can feel embarrassing because you've told yeah. yourself for so long that it's that only stupid people do this. And this is whatever, this is for rural white men in Alabama or something. Um, those are all, all my own prejudices, but like to, to speak it out, to find people who like, there's so many cool Christian girls. I had no idea. Right. And I won't know <laughs> unless I start showing up to places where they are. So, mm. so good. Um, and I, I want to wrap this all together and I have a few more questions. So I, I want to make sure I get to them. But um, you have this new book coming out, L Life Lessons That You've Learned. I'd love to hear the life lesson that you've learned about forgiveness uh, since coming to the Lord and uh, and what that looks like. Mm. Yeah. So there's so there's an entire section on forgiveness. <laughs> whatever you want to highlight here. Um, and I was like, and because I love to write in case this book does well, I already have another book written just because about forgiveness um, that has it goes deeper because I was yeah. <laughs> triple it in in this one. Um, but it's interesting. Do you mean forgiveness of others or forgiveness mm. like God's forgiveness to us? I mean, they they relate to each other, right? Mel and I were just talking earlier about how there's such a spiritual component to the forgiveness piece. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've even heard pastors talking about like whenever they see any type of oppression on a Christian, it's usually related to unforgiveness. Okay. Um, so what, wherever you want to go with wow. that, because I think it's such an important piece. And I, I know it's been a, a touchy thing, even in my own life, you know, and I see that it can be very hard for us to forgive others. But when we receive forgiveness for what we've done, it's like, anyway, yeah. please share, share what you, so, what you've learned. <laughs> I feel like one of the like number one things that I think, I mean, people get so mad at me. The number I would say, one of the, this isn't what I was gonna say. One of the number one things people get mad at me on the internet for is promotion of unconditional forgiveness. Far and away, you should forgive everyone who ever harmed you because it's a beautiful thing and the Bible calls it to do us and you'll feel way better. People lose it. And I know every time I post something about that, I'm gonna, people are going to be mad at me. Um, but it doesn't make it not true. And so I just accept that people get mad at me. Um, and I pray about it if I get upset that they're... <laughs> um, but th I think that's one of the biggest things is that like... And not just the truth that the Bible calls us to forgive our brothers and sisters, but when I could see like one of the lessons not to give it all away, I think it's in this book. 
I'm not even sure. I've written so much. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But one of the coolest stories that I think highlights like the level of forgiveness that, that I, I try to practice in my own life and that I talk about is so my husband is a recovering um, alcoholic too. And when he got his last DUI, they um, send you often to something called a mad panel, which is mothers against drunk driving. Um, And it's usually sort of this scene where it's like a panel of mothers who their kids have been harmed or someone's been harmed. And it's sort of, it's not very forgiving. It's normally just sort of like an exchange of anger, I guess is how I would say it, but they're trying to teach the alcoholic, which they don't know that the alcoholic has a spiritual malady that they need God not to yell that. Um, but it's trying to like, sort of like shame you into like, look at these poor mothers. Okay. So Kevin goes, does not have that experience at all. Instead, what he sees is what looks like a family come out. So a mom, a dad, and a son. Um, and he's like, okay, like, there, you know, the, who knows their other child was killed by a drunk driver or something like that's what, who knows? He's just like, okay, well, I'm prepared to just like be yelled at. And the mom starts telling the story about what happened. And she's like, so my daughter was like out one night. Um, and like, we eventually get a call or police came to the door. I can't remember, um, that our daughter was killed by a drunk driver. And, um, it must've been a call. And then I think police come to the door a little bit after, and they're like, obviously like they start crying, whatever, um, the mom and dad do. And, um, what they think the the police are like, we gave him the highest bail. We, whatever they're trying to show, like, look, we're like tough on this and we're gonna whatever. And they had said that it was like a 16 year old boy. So the guy was underage and he was drunk and he hit their daughter the daughter died. Um, and the mom, like in that moment, prays and she like stops and is like, what's the bail? And he's like, ma'am, it's as high as we can make it, whatever. And she's like, no, what is the bail? And he was like, I don't remember, like a hundred thousand or, and she was like, can you lower it? And he was like, maybe. And she's like, can you lower it to 10,000 or something? And he was like, uh, probably why. And she was like, if you're willing to do that, and if he's willing to come live here, like I'll bail him out. The boy who was on the stage is actually the guy who killed their daughter. Um, and it, the mom like went into this place of forgiveness right away. The dad, I love like the honesty of a dad, right? The dad was like, I was so mad for so long and I could not believe that my wife had brought this killer into our house, right? Like this whole thing. And he was like, so the, the, the kid moves into the daughter's bedroom. Like he's now living in the daughter's bedroom. And the mom was like, we have to show him forgiveness. Like he is suffering. People who aren't suffering aren't 16. And just like he obviously like had errant parents and all kinds of things if he could move in with them right away. Um, And he now like, they're now like speakers basically about like forgiveness and alcoholism and whatever. And they all travel around together and speak. Um, And so like, that's the level of forgiveness that like I'm inspired by that only happens with God, right? Normal people without a relationship with God aren't like, you killed my daughter. I forgive you. Let me show you love so that you can heal and be helpful to other people. That's like not the thought process, right? It's like, you have to go to jail for as long as humanly possible and whatever. Um, and like those, those pieces of forgiveness, like in my life have been some of the coolest things, um, to see. And I don't think that I saw the power of like both the evil power of unforgiveness and the power of just like being okay with letting it go. Like I drank and woke up in weird places. I can't even tell you how many times. I don't know who that is. This is not good. I don't want to get too graphic on here. Lots of terrible things, right? And all of those, I had anger toward the men. Like, was I drunk? Was I complicit in that way? Absolutely. But I had all of this anger. And when it was gone, I was like, I didn't know that I could just realize that we all struggle in life and we're all human. And right. Jesus on the cross, you talked about forgive them. They know not what to do. And to get to that place of like people fight back and they're like, no, they did know. And it's like, no, they didn't in the sense of like, no one would do that if they knew the effect that it was going to have on their conscience, on they don't have a relationship with God. No one wakes up 
at peace the way that I did this morning, like excited about the day, praying on their knees, and then like ends up in a situation where they're like sexually assaulting someone. That's that's not like how that goes. It's people living in pain, crashing into other people living in pain. Um, and when I could get to a place in prayer where I could see that, that was like such a cool and profound experience. Like, so I think that's probably like the biggest lesson in forgiveness is just like the power it holds on so many levels. And it doesn't mean going back to the other person and even telling them that you forgave them. Right. It's like a thing that's between me and God of, can I just let go? So that person doesn't live in my head so that I, I always say forgive and forget. And people are like, what do you mean forget? Like it's, it's still in there. You can still know this story. And I'm like, it doesn't, my definition of forget is it doesn't come to mind unless it's, unless God's brought it to mind so that I can be useful to another person and say like, I've been in that situation too. And I've forgiven that person. It doesn't come up when I'm driving down the road. It doesn't come up when I'm trying to fall asleep. It doesn't come up in the middle of the night. It doesn't come up when I sit down to meditate, right? Like all these times where those things used to come up before that to me is like the power of forgiveness is that like the only time it comes up and then it doesn't come up like with emotion. And how cool is that? that you can like have these experiences where someone's really harmed you. And there was actually an incident a few weeks ago where someone who produced a lot of harm in the history of my life, um, like walked by a coffee shop where I was like just outside of it. Um, he walked by outside and I was having coffee with a friend inside. And it's someone that I've like prayed about a bunch and it didn't change. I like saw him and I was like, oh, <laughs> there used to be a history there, but it wasn't like, I can't believe that this happened and whatever. And this mm-hmm. is someone that like, the police at one point suggested I get a restraining order against. And it was right when I was learning forgiveness. And I was like, no, I'm going to try to learn how to practice forgiveness. <laughs> it's going to be fine. Um, mm. And yeah, and I think it's just the freedom of it is I can't even, it's, I don't even, I don't think I'm supposed to get it, but I don't even understand how it's possible. Wow. So why is Jesus worth it? Uh, I think that's a great segue. Um, yeah, what's what's the difference? What, why? Uh, how do you know what you have with him is real, Lisa? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, I mean, I, this whole podcast is probably just one big why is Jesus worth it um, thing. But I think just the freedom and the peace that I have found in life in ways that truly would never have been possible. And just like nothing else, like I was trying to force change for so long. And then it's like, I surrender to God and the changes come themselves and not, and it's like all of the like spiritual texts that used to read that are like, let go of whatever. And I'm like, how do I let go? What is the, whatever. Um, And then like, that's what God has brought into my life. Like the right people come in, not when I want them, but when I need them <laughs> to come in. Um, and it's just like things that like I thought when I was like stuck in manifestation or something, right? It's like, I'm trying to manifest more money. I'm trying to manifest the right house. I'm trying to manifest whatever. And it's like, it's so weird, but like, it's it's just, you have, I thought I needed those things so that I could feel peace and that, and so that I could feel joy. And I don't know if this is going to be inspiring to anyone that I make less money than I've ever made in my life. But <laughs> So follow Jesus. Like the, <laughs> I realized that that's not what mattered. Uh, and I'm actually like much happier than I was and much more content than I was. Um, and that the things that I thought like, and it's not, it's just like, I naturally don't spend money on all these things that I thought I had to spend money on. And I naturally am happier in my living environment and like with my husband and just all sorts of these like like life is just like so simply beautiful. But then also at the same time, I'm saying that I'm like, and I got a huge publishing deal, right? Like, and (laughs) there's lots of big things that are like moving at the same time. So it's just, to me, it's like the, the peace that comes from it is, is not like anything that I could have ever experienced, no matter what's going on around me. And like, I guess the last little example that I'll give um, is my husband's in this like very long, complicated, like seven year custody battle. Um, He was married before. Um, 
And like, I pray all the time whenever his ex-wife does another, like, it's just a ton of dishonesty, right? Just like crazy things. But the idea that like, it didn't come to mind at all, except when it just like came to mind so that I could use this example, right? And that like, she does something new. My go-to is I just like pray about it. And then she doesn't live in my head. Um, And I didn't know that it was possible to like find peace during the storm, right? Sometimes Jesus stops the storm as the light in my room goes out. (laughs) Sometimes Jesus stops the storm and sometimes he just allows you to find peace in the storm. Um, And it's just like so cool to see all of that because I don't want to like preach some type of gospel that's like, and everything in your life will be perfect because it's like, no, the custody battle is still going on, but I never would have thought that like my husband and I could find so much togetherness and so much peace, even in something that is so painful, I guess, if that Mm -hmm. makes sense. So it's kind of like, the two sides of that. Yeah. I love that. Um, it reminds me, Frank Turek has been on this podcast. He's an apologist and he goes around to different college campuses and he talks about how he knows that God is real. And his answer is, I know God is real by his effects. I can see what he's done, you know? And I think that's true on the big scale. You know, you can see the effects all around us. The Bible says you can look at creation and see, you know, this is an apologetic for who God is. But then also you can see it in the way that it's transformed someone like yours, your life, Lisa, right? Like you can't deny there's power in what's come into your life. And I was talking to a woman recently uh, a few months ago and was sharing with her about Jesus a little bit. And I just said to her, what I have is real. What I have is real. This is real joy, you know, like, and I love my friend Lexi always quotes, uh, I'm sure it's a famous theologian, but Mal, you might know it, but it's, uh, we're just beggars telling other beggars where to find bread, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I just love that. Okay. The final question, unless Mel, do you want to, do you have any final thoughts or do you want to share that after the final question? I feel like you've got something that you've, you've got <laughs> to share. No, I just, a oh man, I, I just relate to the forgiveness piece so much. That's something I feel like the Lord has put on my heart as well this year. Just like there, it's more than just like, I think, it, you know, forgiveness is something that we talk a lot about in Christian culture. Um, but it's not something that we really know, um, like the depths of what, it really means in not just our relationship with the Lord and other people, but like also the consequences of unforgiveness um, and like the roots of defense, the roots of bitterness are ser- like those are serious things and they have spiritual consequences um, when we aren't like in line with the Lord and having that vertical relationship, like everything horizontal truly does get affected by that. And I don't feel like I just, I, man, yeah, love it. Love it. I'm like snapping <laughs> over here. I'm so glad that you talk about that. Um, and that's a part of your story and that's a part of your book. Cause um, mm. I feel like it's not, I feel like it's talked about, but it's not really talked about if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's good. I probably talk about it too much. No, never. Yeah, can you? I don't think you can. Nope. I don't think you can. I don't think you can. What's 70, what's 70 times seven? Is that what Jesus said? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I've never quite said online, I think alcoholism might just be unforgiveness, but like, I think alcoholism might just be unforgiveness. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we might have to quote you on that now that you've said it uh, here, but uh, it's pretty good. Um, The Finding Something Real podcast, Lisa, is about a journey towards finding something real with Jesus. Uh, Real is an acronym for restoration, eternity, authenticity, and love. All of those things can be found in relationship with Christ. Which of those, restoration, eternity, authenticity, or love, stands out to you the most in your life right now and why? Mm. Um, I love all of them. I'll start with that. I feel like, well, I'll start by saying I feel like restoration almost like is my story in a way. Um, but almost I'll say I'm going to take out R and L because I feel like, um, it's restoration to love. Um, Mm. 
because I think that I thought that I just had to like tolerate others and tolerate life. Um, and in order to tolerate, you still have to judge because you have to judge that you have to tolerate it. Um, and I think what's been really cool is seeing a restoration past life is tolerable and into like, I can love others. I can love life. Um, I can like show up in love to other people. Um, so I feel like that journey through just like accepting and tolerating life as it is, which I think can be part of that into, um, love has been like a huge, a huge thing for me. And then a huge theme, because I feel like there's this, like, I don't know, common thing of like, oh, you just have to accept your circumstances. And it's like, but can I learn to love them if God has given them to me? Mm. And- This was really beautiful. Lisa, thank you for coming on here. Thank you for uh, one of my favorite verses is Psalm 34, 5, uh, which says, those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered in shame. And uh, you're you're radiant. Thank you for sharing um, this, your story and God's restoration work in your life. And uh, I'm, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to to talk with you and you too, Mel. I just love you. And this was really precious and I'm, I'm excited to, to share it with others. Until next time. Mm-hmm.